Uh, my name is Angelica Diggs, and I am the Assistant Director of Operations here at the Museum of Early Trades and Crafts. So thank you for everyone for joining tonight. Um, at any point, um, please just use the chat box on the bottom of the screen. Um, I'm going to give a little introduction to ourselves and um, our presenter here tonight. Um, but for any questions, we're going to ask you just place them in the chat box. And then what we'll do at the end of tonight is I will go ahead and read them live and we can get any of that answered for you. Um, so for anyone who is new to the Museum of Early Trades and Crafts, we are located over in Madison, um, and we're a New, New Jersey history museum that really tells the stories of the people who lived and worked in early New Jersey during that time. Uh, we have our exhibits are open, our museum is open, um, we hold various programs and lectures throughout the year, so if you have not fully seen all of our that we have to offer yet, please go right ahead and go on our website. Um, I do want to introduce our speaker tonight, um, which is Gary Sretsky. So Gary comes with a, a long history and background regarding research um, and as an educator and archivist um, in New Jersey's photography history, um, working as the archivist at Monmouth County, um, working as part of the history department in Rutgers, New Brunswick, um, as well as teaching, teaching over at Mercer County Community College. Um, and Gary has an extensive history with research and brings to us tonight quite a bit of knowledge um, and a really interesting presentation for us regarding women photographers in the 19th century. So I'm gonna hand it over to Gary at this time. But again, at any point you have any questions, please feel free to use the chat and we'll keep an eye on that for as we get later into our presentation this evening. So thank you and welcome Gary. Thank you. Um... Can you hear me okay? I think we can, you're good. Mm -hmm. You can hear me? Okay, great. Uh, well, thank you very much, Angelica. I appreciate the invitation to talk this evening. And I wanna thank all those who have who've tuned in on their, on their mobile devices or computers uh, so that we have this uh, virtual network uh, that we can share some information and pictures tonight. Um, the title tells it all as far as what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I can't talk about all the 19th century women photographers, but I will be talking about a few of them. Um, one of the issues that comes up uh, on this subject is uh, whether there are differences in photographs taken by men and women. Uh, some women have made photographs that could not have been made by a man. For example, in the 1870s, Marie Liddy Bonfils the first woman photographer in the Middle East who worked with her husband, Felix, photographed religious women in Beirut who did not want to be photographed by a man. A century later, Cindy Sherman and Francesca Woodman, among others, used themselves as models and produced distinctive art using photography. In their 1975 book, Women and Other Visions, Jack Wellpot and Judy Dater explored differences between the male and female gaze by photographing the same women on different days. One might assert that women photographers can engage female subjects in woman talk and evoke a different expression in a portrait, or one might speculate that women photographers have an easier time getting cooperation from infants and children, but one would be on rather shaky ground making such generalizations. It is true that few women did outdoor photography before the 1880s, in part because the equipment and supplies needed were heavy and single women did not usually travel alone. Regardless of subject, the vast majority of professional photographers were men, often assisted by their wives, children, and others in the studio with photo finishing and other tasks. But there were more women in photography in this era than one might expect from reading the standard histories. Many working class women, especially before marriage, toiled in studios owned by men, and some labored in the photographic manufacturing industry. Note that the studio owner usually took credit for all photographs made in the gallery, and some camera operators were women, such as Maggie Moses in Adolf Beer's Trenton studio in the 1870s. There were also women gallery owners who used initials instead of their first names and have not yet been identified as female. Clearly women played a significant role in photography in the 19th century. One reason there were fewer independent women among professional photographers is that women were less likely than men to have the necessary startup capital. While they could learn photographic processes from a photographer, the pay for such workers was low and that made it difficult to save up to buy their own equipment and secure space for their business. <clears throat> 
Nevertheless, there were some women, estimated at 1% to 3% of all photographers in the U.S. before 1900, who operated their own photography galleries, especially in the 1890s. Some of these women took over galleries after their husband's retirement or death, but a few were photographers who brought their husbands into the business. Some gave up their photo enterprises after marriage and children. In this talk, I'll be presenting a sample of exceptional 19th century women, professional photographers who worked in New Jersey, as well as a few female amateurs who became active near the end of the 1800s. Photography was introduced to the public in 1839, and the first widely used process was that of Louis-Jacques Mondé de Guerre, who uh, named the daguerreotype after himself. Uh, the daguerreotype, as many of you probably know, was a uh, sheet of uh, copper that was silvered, polished to a high gloss, and then uh, before use, it was sensitized by fumes of iodine, put in the camera, and then after the exposure uh, was developed with fumes of mercury. Uh, subsequently, uh, the process was improved through adding uh, fumes of bromine and chlorine. Uh, it was a rather dangerous uh, process uh, and uh, you didn't wanna breathe a lot of these vapors in, but the results were spectacular. Very clear uh, photographs, uh, one, each one one of a kind uh, because there was no negative involved, extremely detailed with good contrast. Uh, this is an example of one uh, from the 1850s uh, in an unusual case designed by Ebenezer Larwell of Newark called the double door style case. The daguerreotype uh, was replaced in popularity by collodion processes, which were introduced in 1850. Uh, the drawback of the daguerreotype was the expense for one thing because it was on copper, but also because they're one of a kind and uh, it would be uh, very advantageous to be able to make multiple copies uh, from a photograph on glass. So glass plate negatives coated with albumin were introduced in 1850. Albumin, uh, I'm sorry, coated with collodion. Collodion is a clear sticky liquid and then it would be sensitized with sil salts of silver. Uh, using collodion, you could also make amber types which were positives. Uh, they're actually uh, an underexposed collodion negative that looks positive with a dark backing. And they were put into the same types of cases as daguerreotypes. And then uh, collodion could also be used to make tintypes, more properly called ferrotypes, because they were on iron plates, ferro referring to iron. Here's an example of an amber type actually showing a woman photographer and a woman subject whose head is being kept still with an immobilizer. And here is a, a tintype that was made by a woman photographer in Patterson, Emma Gould, who had previously worked for John Doremus, uh, who's, uh, who I've written an article about that's in the uh, issue of uh, New Jersey Studies that was just released today. Uh, from collodion glass negatives, uh, one could make contact prints the same size as the negative onto albumin coated paper. Albumin is egg white and photographers could either coat the paper themselves with egg white or they could buy albuminized paper and then sensitize it to light themselves by floating it on a bath of silver nitrate. Uh, these uh, card photographs, uh, is because they would always be mounted on cardboard because the paper was very thin, uh, were uh, provided to the public in standard sizes, which most of which had names. Uh, and the most popular in the 1860s was the carte de visite uh, or visiting card photograph. Uh, and you can see the sizes here on the screen. Uh, they were replaced in popularity by the cabinet card by the 1880s. There were also stereographic views that are two images side by side that look 3D in a viewer. And many other sizes, including the boudoir, the uh, panel, uh, the Victoria card, and uh, 
these were these were not as as popular as the cart de visite and cabinet cart. So here's a, a carte de visite by a, a woman photographer, uh, Julia Lacey, who was uh, married to the photographer Edward Lacey. Uh, she was his uh, second wife. His first wife had passed away. And uh, she um, learned the business and uh, started uh, making photographs uh, herself and uh, under her own imprint in the Lacey studio in Morristown. And here's uh, one from the Kemp studio in Trenton. Emma, Emma Kemp uh, was actually the founder of that studio. And uh, she brought in her husband uh, to help her. And uh, the, so we don't know who, who took the photos at this point. So I found uh, more than 3,000 uh, photographers in New Jersey who were active in the 19th century. They're listed on my web page. Uh, my web address is at the end of this program. And about out of those uh, thousands, about 150 were professional women photographers uh, before 1900. And most of these uh, professionals were only active for a short period of time. And, uh, or they uh, worked for some other photographer. Uh, there were very few amateur women photographers before 1880 because that um, those the garyotype and collodion processes were really cumbersome and uh, you know the collodion they were making glass negatives the glass is heavy so you don't want to travel too much um, it's also very messy uh, but all that changed around 1880 with the introduction of gelatin dry plates which came ready to use right out of the box. So that after 1880, you start to see more amateur photographers, including women photographers. So among the professional New Jersey women photographers, if we look in decades, how many there were in each decade, in the 1840s in New Jersey, there was only one uh, that I've found, Charlotte Prosh. And uh, in 1850s, there were five, including Prosh. And 1860s, there were six, including Hannah Flanagan, who I'm gonna talk about, as well as Prosh. Uh, and then the number uh, goes up steadily. You can see it on the screen. And I'm going to talk about um, some of these photographers that you see here. 1890s, you see there's a big jump to 54. So the first one we'll look at in more detail is Charlotte Prosch, uh, born in 1818 from a German background. Uh, there was one book that identified her as an African-American in its first edition that's been corrected. So if you happen to see that somewhere, uh, that's totally wrong. Uh, she was one of 10 children and several of her siblings were also involved in photography. Uh, she became a daguerreotypist in Newark from 1848 to 1853, which actually is a longer period of time than most of the daguerreotypists in Newark. And there were that was a center for photography in New Jersey because it was the largest city in the state. In, uh, among her siblings, Andrew and George Prosh were very active in photography. Uh, Andrew primarily became a supplier of Daguerrean materials, meaning cameras and other supplies that one would need. And uh, Charlotte undoubtedly got much of her equipment from her brother. Uh, George Prosh uh, started out actually making cameras, uh, and uh, he may have actually made one of the first daguerreotypes in the United States, if not the first, uh, because he got an order for a camera from a guy who has been credited with making the earliest, <laughs> earliest daguerreotype. So uh, he, he actually came to Newark from New York and worked for Charlotte in her studio in 1849 and 50, and then he opened up his own studio in Newark for a while. Charlotte married uh, Alfred Day in 1853, and he's identified as, as a Daguerrean in the uh, city directories, but uh, whether he actually made any before he came to her studio, I've not been able to confirm. So it's possible that she actually taught him how to do it. This is the 1846 New York City directory. And you can see that Charlotte already was a daguerreotypist in New York before she came to New Jersey. And there, right under her name, you see uh, George, 
and that he's, he's a daguerreotypist as well at the same address, uh, same business address. And Andrew is also up, up there. I don't know who Charles was. In 1850, we find Charlotte in Newark. This is Kirkbride's uh, New Jersey business directory. There were eight daguerreotypists in the state listed in that, in that directory. And here is Miss Charlotte Prosht. They added a T for some reason, but that was not her name. Uh, and she's uh, one of the few uh, listed here. And uh, she's in Newark. And uh, right under her is Robert Price, uh, the father of Frank Price, about whom I wrote an article in the previous issue of New Jersey Studies. Uh, so if you're interested in the prices, uh, that's a good source to go to. So here's an example of Charlotte's work um, from uh, 1847. Uh, you can see she has a, a label that she puts under, under the opening in the, in the brass mat that separates the the cover glass from the daguerreotype, which is necessary to protect it from uh, being touched and also from uh, oxidizing from the air because it, it, they'll, they will tarnish with uh, air exposure. And here's another one uh, by Charlotte. Another. This one has some hand applied color. And this is a black and white reproduction. Unfortunately, I don't have a color reproduction to show you. So here's an ad uh, that uh, Charlotte uh, placed in 1853. And she says, Mrs. Day, formerly Miss C. Prosh, because she's now married to Alfred Day. Uh, and she says she has returned to her old place and would be happy to wait upon those who wish a good daguerreotype. So um, she calls now her, her gallery the Excelsior Daguerreotype Gallery. And then she and her husband, after a few years, uh, moved for a couple of years to uh, Michigan, <coughs> excuse me. And while she was there, she did this um, amber type of uh, storefronts in Pawpaw, Michigan. This is the only amber type that I have found uh, by her. And then she returns to uh, Newark uh, with another daughter, uh, with a daughter that with a daughter who was born in Michigan, uh, her husband Alfred um, left the Daguerrean profession, became a baker, and Charlotte also stopped making. Uh, she she got out of the business, and she opened up an ice cream shop in her husband's bakery. They moved to Rhode Island by the late 1860s. By that time, she had four children, and. Uh, she continued being involved with um, baking and, and, um, and, and she, they bought a store for a bakery in New Bedford in 1872. Uh, they moved to Dartmouth, Massachusetts by 1880. Um, her son, George, who was probably named after his uncle, George Prosh, um, became a photographer in the 1870s in Newark, in, in New Bedford. And then later he moved to Brooklyn and I found uh, Charlotte living with George in Brooklyn in 1890. And that's, she probably was helping him uh, with his photography business. Charlotte died uh, in 1899. So she's an example of a, of a woman who had a successful uh, photography business, but after marriage and children, uh, she, she got out of it. And uh, that I think happened to quite a few of the women photographers in the 19th century. This is uh, the tombstone of the Day family in South Dartmouth, Massachusetts. So Hannah Flanagan uh, is a Cumberland County uh, photographer. She was uh, born in 1838 near Bridgeton and her brother uh, became the governor of Arkansas during the Civil War. 
she started out as a daguerreotypist and then advertised herself as a photographist. Now, back in those days, because they were daguerreotypists, ambrotypists, ferrotypists, um, some people wanted to distinguish the fact that they made photographs on paper. So they called themselves photographists. And most of them gave up that appellation uh, after the 1860s uh, and just called themselves photographers. But Hannah continued calling herself a photographist for decades, a photographist. Uh, she opened her own studio in Woodstown in the 1860s near the school, which is a good location for photographers for obvious reasons, because you know then you have chances to photograph uh, children. And she uh, advertised all kinds of photographs, including stereographic views, but I've not been able to find any examples of her outdoor work. Uh, she remained single. She lived with a housekeeper named Lizzie Bishop for more than 20 years. In 1893, Julia Elton, who lived nearby, took over Flanagan's photo business. And my guess is that Julia learned the business from Hannah by working with her. Uh, by that time, Hannah was uh, getting on in years. And uh, Julia probably was helping her out and uh, learned the business and then took it over. Uh, Hannah entered uh, the Cumberland County Insane Asylum in 1913. And uh, in 1919, her niece sold uh, her house to pay for her upkeep in the asylum. She died in 1920 and is buried in Woodstown Baptist Cemetery. So uh, her, she had a long uh, run uh, from the 1860s to the 1880s and uh, all in uh, all in the same uh, location or, or very close to the same location in Woodstown. These are carte de visites. Um, almost all of her known work are carte de visites. This one has uh, quite a bit of information on the back that she had printed uh, all branches of photography. She will do copy work, uh, she extra care with children. Uh, she advises her sitters to avoid blue, pink, and purple um, because uh, those colors didn't come out well uh, in collodion negatives uh, because they were not sensitive to equally to the, all the different colors in the spectrum. Uh, she said she would keep negatives for a year. Um, that might explain why none of her negatives seem to be around. Uh, and. Uh, See, your business hours are nine to four. This uh, pair of uh, Flanagan um, carte de visites are in a typical carte de visite album of the 1860s. The uh, photographs were inserted through a slot at the bottom of the pages. And I mentioned Julia Elton taking over Hannah Flanagan's business. Uh, she lived from 1871 to 1948. And uh, she started out uh, in Woodstown, uh, but she didn't stay there. She, she was there to at least 1905. And uh, she lived uh, a few houses away from uh, Hannah Flanagan. So they were close, uh, they were virtually neighbors. And then uh, sometime between 1905 and 1910, she moved to Pittman in Gloucester County and continued being a photographer there to about 1915. She also, like Flanagan, remained single. She lived with her widowed mother. And uh, she certainly was, had some spunk because in 1916, she went to uh, Trenton to appeal her gas bill and was awarded $6.21 for eight weeks of overcharges. She became the president of the Women's Club of Pittman in the 1920s. And uh, she um, lived to 1948. 
and then was buried back in Woodstown. So here's a cabinet card uh, by Julia Elton, about 1895. And here's an outdoor one. And the, by the early 1900s, uh, the cabinet card in the US had given way to other formats that were mounted in various sizes and um, this is an example of one from the early 1900s. And she's uh, buried it in Woodstown. This is her marker. Uh, Jesse Carhart uh, was a photographer in Phillipsburg in Warren County, born in 1869. Her, her father was a house carpenter. And uh, she was a photographer by 1896, the same year that she married uh, Robert Weller, who became a photographer after she was a photographer. So she's an example of somebody who definitely seems to have taught her husband how to do, photo how to do photography. And uh, they lived with her parents uh, at a combined home and studio in Phillipsburg. And this is a Sanborn map from 1897, and it shows um, 172 uh, Chambers Street, uh, the house uh, on the right, and then in back of the house, a separate building with a photography studio. So then uh, they built a new home on Lewis Street in the late 1890s near the school. And uh, she and her husband moved there um, along with her parents and her siblings. And interestingly enough, she owned the house. And uh, then her husband unfortunately died of consumption in 1900, which we call TB today. So they were married only a few years and he died quite young. This shows the, the lot at their new location at 79 Lewis Street in 1897. And then this is after uh, she did a lot of work there and uh, or her father did a lot of the work actually to build this place. And you can see the photo studio is actually in the house. So Jesse died at the young age of 39 of heart failure due to Bright's disease, which is a kidney problem in 1909. And she left the studio to her younger sister, Alice, who continued the studio. So here you have another photographer, another woman photographer, but not 19th century because she only took over the business in uh, 1909. She probably was working for her sister before then though. So here are some uh, cabinet cards. Um, now the, uh, her work always just says Carhartt on it. It never says her first name. And uh, for that reason, uh, many people don't realize that, you know, this is a woman photographer when they see this. Uh, also mentioned that she learned photography in the studio of John Lee, who is a, a Phillipsburg photographer whose work is very commonly seen today. And she might very well have taken some of the photographs that says Lee on them. That was around 1890 that she was working there. Carte de were still made in the 1890s, but they were uh, much less common than cabinet cards. That's the one on the left, that's a carte de and You're seeing them the same size on the screen, but one of them is uh, two by four and the other is four by six. 
This is from the, the second studio. Here's one of those other formats. This one is called Little Queen. So next one we'll look at is Eva Watson. Uh, she was born in Woodbridge. If, if you do some reading about her, you might see that some reference that she was born in a different place, but uh, I found the birth certificate uh, in the New Jersey State Archives. Actually, Betty Epstein found it. She's one of the people who's watching this program tonight. I wanna thank Betty for locating that. Uh, she was at the archives at that time. And her father was a doctor. Uh, she went to Philadelphia to study painting with the, the famous painter Thomas Ekins in the 1880s. And uh, while she was there, she formed a partnership with another of Ekins students, Amelia Van Buren, and they started an engraving business in the late, and they ran that in the late 1880s and up to the middle 1890s in Philadelphia. And then they moved to uh, Atlantic City from 1894 to 1897. So that's how um, they come to our attention because uh, they became New Jersey photographers. So here's a um, portrait of, of Eva Watson taken by Thomas Atkins. And here's one that might've been taken by Amelia Van Buren. Um, maybe by Ekins. And here's a, a portrait of her in Ladies Home Journal in 1901, by, by which time she had become a very well-known photographer with an international reputation. And so that explains uh, how she got her picture in Ladies Home Journal. So um, with this art training that she had, uh, she, um, started making uh, really outstanding photographs. Uh, and she became a member of a, of a group called the Philadelphia Pictorialists. And her home became a kind of a salon where other photographers would come and share ideas and work. And then she was invited to join the Photographic Society of Philadelphia in 1899, which is, the oldest photography club in the US. It was formed in the 1860s. And they uh, sponsored a series of uh, major exhibitions of photography beginning in the late 1890s. And uh, she exhibited work in those exhibitions. And uh, then she married a, uh, a, a guy who was getting his PhD in Philadelphia, uh, an immigrant from Germany, Martin Schutze. Uh, he um, became a professor of German language and literature and uh, got a job in Chicago. And he, he taught in, at several universities in the Chicago area, University of Chicago and Northwestern among them. And uh, so she moved to um, Chicago in the early 1900s with her husband, unfortunately for New Jersey. Uh, but in any event, uh, in 1902, uh, she was one of the original members of Alfred Stieglitz's uh, group of photographers called the Photo Secession, uh, which published an outstanding uh, journal called Camera Work, and uh, Eva's uh, photographs appeared in Camera Work. Um, after being in Chicago for some years, where she opened a portrait studio, uh, where she did uh, portraits of uh, many, many uh, significant people in the Chicago area. Uh, she and her husband began uh, going in the summers to Woodstock, New York, where there was an artist colony called Birdcliff. And uh, there she became more involved with painting and less in photography. And by the time she died in 1935, she was pretty distant 
from the world of photography at that point. And it was a retrospective exhibit of her art that had paintings and drawings, but uh, none of her photographs. Her partner uh, in Atlantic City uh, and, uh, and before, Amelia Van Buren was uh, born in New York, but her family had moved to Michigan when she was about two or three years old. Uh, in the early 1880s, she moved to Philadelphia where she studied with Thomas Aikens and also should mention that Thomas Aikens wife uh, was very much involved in all of this uh, education that was going on in, in the world of photography in Philadelphia. And uh, through the Aikens, uh, she met uh, Eva Watson. Here's a, a portrait, a pretty well-known portrait of Amelia Van Buren by Thomas Aikens. And here's a, um, another picture of Amelia Van Buren by Aikens. So uh, I mentioned earlier, they had this photo business, engraving business in Philadelphia, and then they moved to Atlantic City uh, where they had the studio from 1894 to 1897. And both of them were exhibiting in the annual salons um, between 1898 and 1900 that, that drew photographers from all over the US and Europe. Um, Francis Benjamin Johnston, uh, who had a very long career in photography and uh, was a, a very um, important figure in the history of photography, but not in New Jersey, uh, organized a big exhibition called American Women Photographers that was shown in Paris uh, during the Paris Exposition. It was kind of a world's fair that millions of people uh, went to. I think something like seven or eight, nine million people attended that fair. and. Uh, both Van Buren and Watson were included in that exhibit. And Johnston also wrote articles about leading women photographers in the 1890s. And she profiled Watson in one of, one of her articles. Um, Van Buren um, moves to Detroit in 1898. And uh, then she starts going in the summers to an art colony in Tryon, North Carolina, and eventually settles there uh, permanently uh, year round in 1920, uh, where she died uh, there in 1942. So here's uh, some examples of the, uh, Van Buren and Watson's work in Atlantic City, uh, a beautiful uh, portrait on a cabinet card. Here's a uh, somewhat smaller than a cabinet card called a cabinet gem. And this is the cover of a book that's about that Paris exposition, that Paris World's Fair. Uh, and on the cover is uh, an Amelia Van Buren photograph. And to show you that um, Eva Watson's work has been published quite a bit. This is the cover of Camera Magazine, 1977. Here's a portrait that Eva Watson did of Matilda while while was active as a photographer from 1896 to 1920 and specialized in in portraits taken at people's homes uh, she moved to san francisco in 1920 and died in 1948 camera notes was um, a, the journal of the uh, new york camera club and it was a, a precursor to uh, camera work um, edited by Alfred Stieglitz. The, uh, these are two by Eva Watson. Um, the gentleman on the left, William H. Rao, was a, a very well-known Philadelphia photographer. He was um, associated with William H. Bell in Philadelphia uh, early in his career who um, was his father-in-law. And uh, the picture on the right is from Camera Work, 1905. 
Eva Watson and other photographers uh, who were art oriented uh, were very influenced by J Japanese art around 1900. Was, um, the, the movement was called Japonisme and uh, it featured uh, elongated um, photographs that kind of were reminiscent of, of scrolls among other uh, aspects. And uh, these are two by Eva. This is from a, uh, a magazine called The Studio in the early 1900s. Um, the studio had some special issues on photography. There, it was a, a quite a thick, large magazine. Here's another uh, from special issue on art photography in 1905. And this is uh, from a book illustration. The, it's from a halftone uh, illustration in a book. So that's why the, the quality uh, of the picture isn't very, the reproduction quality isn't very good, but it's a sweet photo. This is from after she moved to uh, Chicago. Here's a couple of books with uh, Eva Watson uh, photos on the cover. One on the left, women photographers in turn of century America. And the one on the right about pictorial photography in Philadelphia, about those uh, big exhibitions from 1898 to 1901. And here's a uh, self-portrait by Eva Watson done in 1935. So uh, what I would say, you know, uh, when you talk about the famous women photographers of who associated with New Jersey, uh, probably Eva Watson Schutze would be uh, pretty close to the top of the list. Uh, Margaret Burke White uh, would be another one for the 20th century, but uh, Eva certainly certainly up there. Uh, um, Edward and Mary Sherman were uh, photographers in Camden. Um, they were born respectively in 1857 and 1866 in Pennsylvania. They were married in 1883. They did not have children. And they were active as photographers in Camden from 1897 to 1913. Uh, Mary was one of almost a dozen women photographers active in Camden in the 19th century. I don't have time to talk about the others. Um, and uh, they operated something called the Crystal Type Photo Company in 1897. And then uh, the Sherman Art Studio in Camden, which started as one, but then they opened up a second one, like a North, a North Camden and a South Camden um, location. They also had a branch in Burlington in the early 1900s. And they had uh, summer um, galleries, uh, some, uh, galleries operated in the summer in Holly Beach and Wildwood, which are next to each other. Uh, they did very well, and that allowed them to invest in Florida real estate um, in Saint Pete, near St. Petersburg. So uh, they sold their studio in Camden in 1913. They kept the seaside studios in New Jersey and there their uh, intention was that uh, they would come back in the summer and operate at the Jersey Shore. Uh, but in the winter, they would go to uh, uh, Florida and have a studio down there. It didn't work out. But let me first show you uh, some examples from uh, the Sherman studio. And this is uh, from a book called Camden, published in 1904. It's illustrated completely with photos from the Sherman studio. And Mary Sherman is actually credited for this particular photo uh, in an ad for the North studio of the Shermans uh, in Camden. And it says that she is the artist at this North studio and that her husband will 
go to the North Studio by appointment only. So he would only go there if you know somebody really wanted him to take a picture. Um, but normally she did all the work at the North Studio while he operated at the South Studio. This is also from that 1904 uh, Camden book, The Armory. And these just say photo by Sherman, so we don't know which one of the Shermans took this, these pictures. So they had a big property near St. Petersburg and uh, they had, uh, it was pretty isolated. They were half a mile from their nearest neighbor um, and they hired uh, nearly a dozen African-American men to clear the land so that they could um, subdivide it for building lots. And uh, what happened was that in the middle of the night, um, somebody came up to the window of the bungalow uh, the, the window was open and uh, they shot Edward Sherman in his bed with a shotgun and killed him. And then uh, two men came through the window and dragged Mary Sherman out where they beat her and robbed her and left her for dead. But she woke up uh, a couple hours later and crawled to the neighbors half a mile away uh, to get help. And uh, there was a big hue and cry to try to find the people who had done this. And two of their former employees were arrested. And one of them uh, was taken to the jail and lynched uh, by a mob of 1,500 men and women. Uh, it was a terrible lynching. Uh, they, I won't go into the details of it, but if you're interested, it's easily found uh, on the internet. And uh, the other one uh, was uh, convicted. Um, and Mary Sherman did come to the trial from New Jersey to testify. And she said she couldn't identify the appearance of um, the accused, but uh, she recognized his voice, she said. And uh, she went back and she lived in Camden County after that. Took her quite a while to recover. Now, another photographer from this same area uh, is Henry Etta Wardle, who, who operated and she lived in Riverton. Uh, she was born in Philadelphia and uh, she was a photographer for Henry D. Garns and Company, which operated in Philadelphia and Camden from, the, from 1877 to the 1900s. Uh, Henry Etta remained single. She lived with a widowed aunt uh, in Riverton, where she died in 1909. So she did not have her own studio, but apparently she made the photographs in the Camden location of the Garn studio during the time that she worked for him. So uh, this is an example of uh, Garns and company. Uh, Henrietta is apparently was the end company. Uh, and uh, there's a cabinet card from Federal Street in Camden. This one's a little later, around 1900. Another photographer, also in the same area, uh, David uh, Lothrop's daughter, Bertha. David Lothrop had a studio for uh, th about 30 years in Philadelphia, uh, but he began living in Riverton. And uh, Bertha uh, lived with her parents until she got married in 1905, uh, when she was about 35 years old. Uh, she attended the Academy of Fine Art in Philadelphia, so she had the art training, and she worked together with her father at the Riverton studio uh, behind their house, and she was still there as late as 1905 uh, when she got married, uh, 
And I suspect that uh, after she got married, she didn't do too much in Riverton. But by 1911, in any case, uh, she had moved uh, to Pennsylvania with her husband. So this, this is just to show you an example of David Lothrop uh, imprint and a, and a trompe l'oeil style photograph um, from about 1890 from Philadelphia. And here's, here's a, a cabinet card from the Riverton studio. It just says Lothrop. So it could be by either David or Bertha. That's a football as they look back then. So she began specializing in portraits of children and advertising photography, which was something new because um, the halftone uh, had only been recently introduced. And uh, now you started to see a lot of photographs um, being reproduced in, in magazines and, and newspapers. And uh, she also was an early user of flash photography for portraiture. And flash in those days meant uh, flash powder. And it, it was pretty tricky to use uh, because uh, quite a few uh, accidents occurred with this powder. Uh, I just read a, recently about another photographer in the 1890s who was going around with bandaged hands because the, the flash exploded, uh, the powder exploded prematurely. Um, and uh, she presented a slideshow of her child studies um, to the Photographic Society of Philadelphia in 1894. And she published her own book about called Indoor Photography and Flashlight Studies of Child Subjects in 1896. 40 pages. She also published, uh, a, there was a chapter in the American Annual of Photography, which continued in, up until the 1950s. Uh, it was a long run of annuals. Uh, there was a whole chapter by her in the 1896 annual about uh, children. And uh, this one writer, Juan Abel, uh, who wrote a, a, an article about women photographers in 1901, said that uh, Bertha got high prices for her advertising photos because she avoided stiff conventional poses. She and her husband had a daughter in 1909, Eleanor. So here's from the American Annual of Photography in 1896, and that's her text. And uh, you can see some examples of her work here. And this is also from that annual. So photographers like Bertha Lothra were a big inspiration to other women uh, who were, became interested in photography in the 1890s because it had become much easier. Um, the Kodak had been introduced in 1889 with uh, flexible roll film. Uh, you didn't need to photograph with glass plates anymore, although some photographers continued using glass plates, but uh, amateurs increasingly did not. Uh, and uh, so with the increased ease of photography, people could start making photographs of their children. So uh, she moved to Abington uh, Township in PA, and then she began exhibiting as Bertha Raydell uh, with her, her married name. Uh, and uh, she lived to 1932. So now I'm gonna to turn to a couple of amateur photographers to close this out. Um, Emma Ivins, who lived from 1857 and 1940, was the daughter of James Yard, who was the editor and publisher of the Monmouth Democrat newspaper in Freehold. And she married William Ivins, a lawyer, who um, unsuccessfully ran for mayor of New York in 1905. And uh, they, uh, after she uh, was married, she had a son named William Ivins Jr. who became the director of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And he, he was associated with the museum for decades. So he, he became a pretty familiar figure in the art world. And uh, Emma, uh, you know, photographed uh, her family. This is from around 1900. This is uh, 
I believe her sister. Or her husband's sister. This is her son. William, who became the Metropolitan Museum guy. This is her daughter, Margaret. Another amateur uh, was Rena Lawrence, who lived in Plainfield. Um, she was uh, born in New York in 1869, uh, but she lived in Plainfield from the 1880s to the 1930s. And uh, she unfortunately got polio when she was 10 and then multiple sclerosis. So she became confined to a wheelchair, but that did not um, seriously hinder her photographic activities. She lived with her uh, mother, uh, her father had passed away uh, and her, her siblings, and she ran a catering business from her home. Here's her, uh, her business card, homemade cakes, pies, bread roll, sandwiches, salads to order. So at the Plainfield Public Library, they have 864 gelatin dry plate negatives. Uh, the earliest one is th that has a date on it is 1901, but there are a lot of them without dates. So I'm pretty sure that she started before 1900 and she used glass plate negatives. Um, which, as I mentioned, some photographers continue to do that, particularly those who were serious about their work and wanted the best possible quality. And uh, she didn't limit her work to Plainfield. She got around I, uh, and she, she took trains places and probably also uh, went by car with others and photographed. Interestingly, she was opposed to women's suffrage. Uh, she wrote letters to the local newspaper against it. Um, and then uh, in later life, uh, she had to um, be hospitalized and she lived 15 years in a hospital in New York City and died in 1948. This is uh, Rena Lawrence about 1920. Here's a portrait of her mother. And her brother. And he's taken around the house. And here are photographs taken on excursions. This is uh, from a glass negative. And that's uh, all we have time for. So um, I'd be glad to try to uh, answer questions if you have any. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Gary. That was very interesting. I'm going to give it one minute um, just to allow any questions to go into the chat. Someone did ask, um, I just wanted to mention publicly if the recording, um, if they would have access to the recording for this evening. So recordings are, um, they're, they're private per presenter. So if you wanted to access any extra information um, from Gary, you can see his website and information right there online. Um, but we do not publicly post recorded programs onto our website. Um, except with permission, um, or if you're a member through some of our programs, we do have a virtual library with permission from presenters. We, we do share in that programming on our website for members only. Um, so I hope that answers that. Any extra questions, you can send me an email. Um, let me take a look. I had, um, I had one question, um, which it, just from observing, and, and you can tell me, Gary, it, this might be pretty obvious. It seems that in more of the 19th century, a lot of the photography was focused on singular or like a family portrait style. And then right around the 1900s, it, at least from what I saw in your presentation, it made almost a quick shift to more of like a documentary style or experiment experimentation, maybe as more photographers were becoming into practice. Um, so I'm curious about that. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll be glad to answer that. I, I just want to mention first with uh, that 
um, on my on my web page, there is a contact button. So you, you can easily uh, use that to write to me afterwards if you have questions that you would like answered. And uh, my web page also includes my lecture schedule. And I will be giving this lecture again um, in a couple of months somewhere uh, online. So uh, if you if you want to see it again, you can. Uh, yeah, there is a definite shift uh, in the 1890s in the appearance of photographs. Uh, it becomes much freer. Cameras are now handheld uh, optionally. Uh, and, and you have many more uh, people who are um, taking photographs more casually than they had before. Uh, when um, generally the cameras were big, you, you were using glass plates, you had to prepare the negative uh, before you took the picture. Uh, it was very involved. Now with roll film, you could snap away and hope that you got one good one. Uh, so uh, it, definitely things loosened up a lot. And I did show um, a picture of Matilda Weil, uh, who was a, a leader in popularizing at-home portraits. And th those um, start becoming um, more and more widespread uh, and more professionals started offering that as an option instead of coming into the studio and doing the more formal uh, portrait in the studio. Fascinating, thank you. Um, you had a, a thank you from Betty Epstein. Um, Holly uh, Mandala noticed that it's interesting that most of the women you discussed never married. I noticed that too, or had very, a lot of um, dramatic stories or a lot of things that these photographers have had to overcome um, in some of the, the stories that you shared is very interesting. Um, Susan Newberry uh, has a question. Um, have you ever found any of these photographers' photos at house sales, flea markets, or antique stores, or are they already held at uh, by historical institutions? Oh, I do find them at uh, antique shops and on eBay and uh, uh, flea markets. Um, now, some of them like uh, Carhartt, uh, you know, it doesn't say her first name on there. So you have to know that uh, that's, a, that's a woman photographer uh, before you start going through the piles of photographs that you might find at these places. And I will say um, at the museum, we have a current exhibit um, called Uncovered in our gallery. We have one gallery that changes once or twice a year. Um, and we do have a number of daguerreotypes in our collection. And I, I would be fascinated one day to put you in touch, Gary, with our curator. And uh, we're doing a, an inventory of our collection right now. And we'll be finding out more details about those, um, those daguerreotypes in our collection as we move along. So. Another question came in, uh, is there any way of identifying the photographer of a glass negative? Well, some photographers um, wrote their name on the glass negative uh, and it, it would print out when they made the contact print. But if they didn't, it's very difficult to identify the photographer. Um, sometimes, you know, if, if it's an outdoor photo and it's, it's, it's been printed and they, they published it, let's say a stereo view, for example, and those would typically have the photographer's imprint on it. And then, you know, you could tie the negative to the published uh, photograph, but just a glass negative by itself without any other information would be really hard to identify the photographer. Another question is, uh, why do you think there was such a jump in women photographers from um, copper to glass negative? That's a good question. Well, around 1880, um, actually in 1880, um, the uh, gelatin dry plate negatives were introduced and photographers gave up on collodion wet plate negatives. They were called wet plate because you had to sensitize them right before use and expose them in the camera while they were still damp and then develop them right away before they dried. So you had to have a dark room with you when you photograph. Uh, so this was real involved. Uh, you had to have a big commitment uh, or, or you had to have your own studio in order to do this type of work. But with gelatin dry plates, you could use them right out of the box. So in 1880, um, you start to get more uh, amateur photographers in the 80s and, uh, and more and more women among them. 
uh, started photographing. Uh, camera clubs start in New Jersey in the 1880s. The first one was in, at Rutgers in 1886. And there were women members to that camera club. Uh, so you really start to see an increase in women participation in photography uh, after, after the, it became easier to use. And then another big jump in the 90s with the introduction of roll film and Kodak cameras where all you had to do is press the button and you could take a picture. Great. Well, it looks like that's all of our questions for this evening. So thank you so much, um, Gary, from us and from other attendees for fascinating presentation tonight. I think we all learned a lot. Um, I'm going to um, go ahead and just quickly also type Gary's uh, website into the chat. So if anyone wants to click on that before they head on out, you can do so. And also the museum's website, but please do check out Gary's website as well as the museums for other upcoming programs and events. So thank you everyone. Have a great evening. Thank you.